we would have to accentuate. You know, give him a little bit more weight on that turn or put his head down a little bit more. There's a lot of dialogue that gets said between the two characters. We have to bring that alive through animation and we have what we're using as gestures. Why would they mow down all these people? You can't let everyone in. If you turn off the sound, you'd know that they were talking to each other. And that really helps accentuate the relationship that the two have together. There's, we have certain animations that play in the beginning of the game on Ellie. She's traveling with Joel, who she doesn't really know. There's a lot of gestures to make her look nervous. Just her overall stance. Later on in the game, they develop a relationship through the animation, not just the dialogue. You can see that she's more comfortable around him. If that reads well with the player, then, you know, we're doing our job. We want her to look scared when she gets a gun. We want her to look scared of the gun. See, if, if she's gonna aim, she wouldn't be like super trained aim. She would be more like some scared. But at the same time, it needs to look cool and feel cool to the player that plays. It's really just these little tiny details that we're doing, and it's coming across. It's co it's working out well. We don't do facial capture. We don't track eye movements on stage. It's just the motion capture data. So everything that you see on the faces is hand keyed. As you can see, this is all of her mocap data. And so when I'm doing something like this, I go back and forth to the performance that she was giving. And I watch just this section over and over and over again. So this is our default face. I can make everything super extreme and make her all squinty and angry, turn her frown down. I can open her mouth stick her tongue out. <laughs> it's listen, watch. Okay, where where's her mouth at this point? Like, is it open? Is it is she making like a grimace? About Tess, I, I don't even know. What here's how this thing's gonna play out. You don't bring up Tess, ever. Matter of fact, we just keep our histories to ourselves. We shoot all of it to just get the body motion, and then we we'll do a, sec a second pass with the cameras. The scene's playing back on an overhead projector, but it's also playing back on a monitor that's attached to my rig. Sean and I would go to the stage and motion capture the camera filming the scene, and so he would get a whole wide shot, a whole close-up for the whole scene. You know, you can change your lenses, you can use your standard 35, 85, 50s, whatever, all that sort of live-action uh, camera cinematography, you can apply it on stage. We make sure to go back in and add flaws we keep the confinements of the room so the camera can't go past a certain wall because then we have this cheated perspective. If the cameraman bumps into the wall, we keep it. You know, missing focus hits when you're pulling focus, going too close to the character and reframing those little moments in there. kind of keeps it very cinema verite. If everything was too perfect, you wouldn't be able to put your finger on it, but you'd be able to feel it. It would just feel off. It's, it's very much about grounding it, despite having you know, the option to do whatever we want. Being able to place the cameras anywhere we want after the motion capture gives us both advantages and disadvantages. The biggest advantage is it means that we just have to nail the best performances we can get and the luxuries that we can always swap it. The 3D world gives you limitless opportunities with, with cameras and movements, exposures, all that stuff. Most of these cameras are sort of set up like real world cameras. So we have lens, we have f-stop that will create the depth of field. Uh, we have aperture to, you know, set out, film back and all that stuff. You know, master and then I have my close-ups, my over-the-shoulders. Sort of just like a live-action production. Let's go to camera 30 at, at the 23.458. Then I get that kind of weird, you know, bend across his back. The closer I bring the camera, the more bend I get, which is, you know, doesn't look right. It doesn't look as, it looks less cinematic than if I do that, which flattens the whole thing. And, and I'm trying to also catch Ellie. I can scrub a little more, you know, catch her in the back here. So I want a you know, longer lens of that kind of stuff. Since I had only had experience working with live action before I got into video games, it was a kind of a cool adjustment to be able to have this extra flexibility in post, to swap a line of dialogue for something different, even though that's not what the actor said at that time, and to be able to still have a close-up on them while they said it. You get to make it probably more perfect than you could ever make it in live action. How far are we gonna take as this? As far as it needs to go! Where was this lab of theirs? 
because our actors are both the voice and their body, they get to play, they get to try things, they get to work with our director to kind of come up with new ideas, or even our director will have a new idea on the spot that wasn't there in the script, but realizing when he sees it, oh, well, this would actually be better, this might feel better. And those changes all just happen organically there on the set. He could even lead straight into his thing. He's like, no shit, yep, Ty would want to do that. So we ran into our lives and drove cross country. Keep it pretty succinct. Like, we got the bikes, throw them cross country. Cool. It's shocking to me that this is Neil's first time directing. There was a specific tone and a specific uh, approach that, that Neil and Bruce wanted to take with this. It just came down to there's nobody knows the story better than you, and then there's nobody that knows these characters better than you. Why don't you just do this? He and I actually had a conversation about it. He says, I think I'm going to try this my, uh, myself, and I'm not sure. Neil was fantastic. At all times. The floor is yours. Okay, so remember, you've been running away from this turret mounted truck. If you come to this dead end, you're gonna look up and see a potential way out. And action. Well, check it out. I mean, his writing is honest, and it's dangerous, and it's natural. And I love his economy of words. He doesn't hit everything on the nose, so it leaves it open for you to interpret and bring some nuances and things like that. The entire process is collaborative, but really it's led by Neil's willingness to change and, and, and flow and decide something doesn't work, you know, fix it right there in the moment. And it is... Uh, is something that's very foreign to, to the way that TV and film is done now, where everything has been micromanaged by the time you get it to the table read, and no one wants you to change anything, and everything's very precious and has been rewritten with notes from 20 people in suits, and you can't do that uh, just just uh, anywhere in entertainment these days. Yeah, I just I want to make sure I, I think I swung too far over to, to this way, and, and now it's, it's a little bit of making jokes about it, and I need to like, bring it back to... To center. There's one scene in the game where um, we see Joel um, not as a ruthless survivor but as a father. I knew from the very beginning that he's gonna lose his daughter and uh, I just told Neil, it's like when that day comes for us to shoot that I need a heads up. About a week before he said it's time we're gonna do that scene. I was like okay because I knew that I, I was going to have to go to this place that, that you don't really want to go to as an actor. You want to find some aspect of reality that you can um, empathetically draw from, you know? Troy and I were both kind of just like walking around for a while and just kind of getting into the to the zone. And he, and well, my grandpa died when I was eight. He was like my dad. And so that that's always what I use to get into that that place. You know, I, I started recalling all those memories and starting pulling up all those feelings and they're just right right underneath the surface. And when I walked back in, everyone realized that something was different. They kind of like calmed down, you know. You could feel the energy just like drop a little bit more. It was brutal. <laughs> I just, I lose my shit. I mean, just completely break down. Please don't do this, don't do this, please God, no. <laughs> oh God, no. The sound stage was deathly still. It was the first take, and I felt really good about it. And it's like Neil said, "Okay, let's do it again." And so you do it again, and automatically you feel like you're manufacturing because you're trying to go back to that place, and you know you you're in that actor nightmare of you know trying to get back to that reality. And we go through it again in fifth and sixth and seventh take, and I'm just exhausted. I'm crying between takes, and I'm looking at Neil, going, "This is really, really hard." And um, Finally, after like the eighth or ninth take, he said, all right, I think we got it. I was like, oh, thank God. And I went outside and I was just jacked up for the rest of the day. Just, just, I mean, a wreck emotionally. But we got it. Then two weeks later, he calls me. <laughs> and he says, uh, so we need to reshoot a scene. I'm like, cool, what scene are we doing? And he just looks at me. I said, dude, don't do this to me. And you can either at that moment, uh throw your hands up in the air and say, fuck this, and walk away. Or you can say, okay, this is an opportunity to get it more right. I'm like, okay, all right, if you don't think you got it, I'm gonna show you that you got it. We've got it in the can. And so we go through it again, and it just feels fake, feels artificial. And Neil goes, go through it again, we start doing it again. And I'm getting madder and madder with each take. And finally, about the fourth take, <laughs> Neil comes over to me, and I love him so much, he goes, 
So I'm picking up on some resistance. I was like, you're damn right you're picking up on some resistance. We've got this in the can already and we're just wasting our time and we're wasting all this effort and energy. And then he started talking me through the scene. He was like, what I need you to do is I need you to, to just strip yourself of all these ideas and I need you to hit this beat and this beat and this beat and this beat, which just makes it sound so mechanical and it's such an emotional scene. So we start going through it and literally I am mindlessly doing these things at this point. It's okay. I know it hurts, baby. I know. So I'm gonna lift you up. I'm gonna lift you up. I'm gonna get you over here. Come on, baby. Come on, work with me, please. God. Baby. Sarah. Sarah! Don't do this to me, baby. Don't do this to me, baby. Come on. Don't. And he stops, he goes, now we got it. And I realized that the reason why I wanted that first take to work was because I wanted everyone to look at me and go, wow, what an actor. And that's not what the scene needed. Those moments where you just have to sort of calm your ego down and, and just go back and do your work. That scene actually works, not because of me, but in spite of me. And that really is the marker and, and definition of working with a true, truly good director. There are many like it, but this one is yours. Why don't you have a seat? Okay. All right, everybody calm down. Calm down. <laughs> Thanks, guys. It's the director's chair. Working on the project, we knew we wanted to have a pretty minimalist soundtrack. And we, we had a folder where we just throw music in there. Looked at the folder one day and we saw, we have a lot of stuff here from Gustavo Santolaya. We're looking for a composer, what if we reached out to him? Oh no. Sarah. Move your hands, baby. I know, baby, I know. Listen, I know this one. You're gonna be okay, baby, stay with me. I'm gonna pick you up. I know, baby. I know it hurts. Come on, baby. Please. I know, baby. I know. Sarah. Sarah. Baby. <laughs> <laughs> been and still is kind of like a road movie. I grew up in Argentina. I came to the United States in 1978 because uh, we had a horrible political situation in Argentina. We had a military dictatorship where 30,000 people disappeared at the hands of the government and many other more were tortured and I was blacklisted. It was just impossible for me to keep on living there. I've been in jailed many times since I was probably 15 years old just because I had long hair and I play an electric guitar. So I, I, I had to embark on this trip. I can relate to that kind of need of movement and going to the next, next place and the next place and the next step. I'm always attracted to uh, the possibility of getting involved with a project from the very beginning. I like to work from the script and talking to the director. It's never been, oh, give me a piece like this or give me a music that's this. It's just been very high level. Here's what the story's about. Here are the themes. Go write some stuff. Since I don't know how to really read or write music, by the way I, I, I produce music is actually recording it. So I like to come early in the projects and, and, and I did in The Last of Us. One thing that was fantastic from the very, very beginning was the freedom that I had to try and to do whatever I felt could work, you know? As the story was still being written, you could listen to this piece of music and just get a sense of where this needs to go tonally because the music was still inspiring the story. So that was the great thing of having the music written so far in advance. And at the beginning, I mean, I was going really out with some things and 
sometimes some of those things were the ones that they liked the most, you know. So I really felt very motivated to work and I enjoyed in immensely working. It was this very organic back and forth experience where one element was inspiring the other and vice versa. I, I needed to go into some more dark places, more textural and not necessarily melodic. I'm always trying to sort of push myself into playing instruments that I don't know how to play. There's an element of uh, danger and innocence. Lennon once said, you know, give me a tuba and I, 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 I will be able to do something. I'm an artist. I, sh I should be able to do something. I like to put myself in that situation. So <clears throat> these are just PVC pipes, the one you see now in construction. Or instruments that I know kind of twist them. From the concept of the prepared piano, you know, I mean, I've worked with uh, with prepared guitar to stick things into the guitar and things like that. And also in The Last of Us in particular, I work with a detuned guitar, so I, I really tune the guitar extremely low. And the result is, you know, strings that are very loose and will produce not only sound, but produce noise. Because I, I believe, you know, every uh, environment has its own sound. We have in our, you know, small studio, we have actually the possibility to record almost anywhere, including the bathroom, and we have done some fabulous recording, especially in the kitchen. When you score to picture, which is something that I don't do, then you know what you're going to expect. But when you provide people with music, like I've done in all the films that I've done, and then you see it, how the director decided to use that, you know, in what particular way he, he uses it or where they edit it. It's always fascinating to me. I watch a scene and, and I'm going, you know, it's fantastic how they use this piece. I would have never, of all the music that I've done, probably I would have never used this piece there, but it works you know, great. So I like that that uh, feeling of uh, collaboration. I think, you know, the guys also that work in programming and adapting that music to the game, they should share a lot of, of the credit for the, the end result. In the beginning, there was silence. Yes. Then they hired sound designers. Then they, they, regret, they regretted came. that decision. <laughs> much quieter environment like that, we really had to fill out the soundscape with much more natural sounds, much more detailed, delicate sounds. The tension comes from the lack of sound in a way. Your brain is, is, is thrown off because we're expected to hear buses and crowds. All of a sudden I hear wind and leaves rustling. Again, it's creepy and beautiful at the same time because it's almost like I'm going on a hike, but I'm in a downtown area. To Neil, Neil, I mean, we were going through the iterations. I mean, he just did not want like yells mm -hmm. and screeches and what he called like you know kind of witchy qualities, right. the cackling witch. He didn't want anything like that. It was a little bit of a head scratch to figure out. Okay, how do we make it sound human but not human? Yeah. We really did not want to use any animals. We wanted these all to be human. Derek and I basically decided to hire a couple of voice actors who did some interesting work uh, vocally to come see if they could come up with something. And we worked with this girl, Misty Lee. She started giving us these really great screeches. And that's no process. Yeah, that's just her voice. 
And it started going into this little click. We also used a little bit of Phil's voice. Uh, we'd combine that also with an occasional, um, Derek. That's just me, you know, moving my tongue. Just, And what that kind of did was it sort of grounded it all like like maybe in, in the mouth area, the wetness, all that kind of stuff. And it adds a nice texture, actually. This is a composite of all the bits I just told you about. Sounds like a Snapple bottle. Oh, the lid? Like the lid, yeah. That's a good idea. <laughs> Fuck, where were you guys like months ago? <laughs> Why did we think of that? Why did we think of that? <laughs> <laughs> Viewers at home, you're probably wondering what this is. <laughs> Let me tell you. About 10 years ago, I, I saw this Synthy A suitcase synth. I wanted to get one. This finally arrived in January, just in time to start using. I thought, well, what can I do with this? Uh, in Lakeside, uh, there's a whiteout that happens, and this thing has a, a noise generator, which gives really convincing wind sound. Uh, the military still has technology. There's sirens uh, and alarms, so I wanted to try some new concepts. Nothing, it's just... I've never seen anything like this, that's all. You mean the woods? Yeah. Never walked in the woods. It's kind of cool. We consciously take in consideration uh, lighting in the beginning. Most of the game, we don't really have any real man-made light sources, so everything is naturally lit. In the past, you know, we could use a lot of uh, artificial light, but in a world that has no electricity. We have to uh, hide most of the time, and, and that requires being very close to certain assets. Just stay back. Detail's expensive, and if you build up too much of it, you end up running into technical problems, right? Your engine slows down. When the frame rate goes down, everyone can bring up the, the profiling tools and see which parts of the frame actually cause the drop of the frame rate. This is the profiling tool. These are all the SPUs. Here's the GPU, and then here's the PPU. You can see, like, here's the main process, and here's all the sub-processes, and you can see, tells you, like, how many milliseconds and cycles it's taking. The programmers are whiz at modifying this stuff and realizing, oh my God, why is this thing so big? We're taking 10 milliseconds on this thing. And then that's when they come over and find somebody and hit them over the head with a club and be like, why are you doing this? I love, we, we put the 30 uh, frames per second goal because that's what we shoot for. Someone nicely put the 60 frames per second goal. It's like, yeah, we're not going to hit that. Light errors usually can come up with different lighting setup that still looks great, but, but is less costly in terms of performance. Um, did, did you talk to the character artist about her hand? So her face is getting a lot of spec, but then her arm is just like bone dry. You think something we can tweak in Shader? We'll have to send back to uh, character team Michael to take a look. I can play with the lights and see if that creates more like spec. Yeah. I've never ever focused so much on lighting and how much, how much sensitivity there is to that here. One of the first lighting scenarios I had to do was like 7 a.m. like overcast. And I'd like wake up early and like take photos with my phone. What color are the shadows? What color is the light? It is a master's course unto itself of how to deal with ambient lighting because I've never had to use it so much. Man, this is kind of sad. What is? All this music that's just sitting here. No one's around to listen to it. I don't know, it doesn't seem right. All the characters cast soft shadows onto the environment. Even when there is no direct sunlight or no direct light sources, we still have nice fuzzy shadows. When you're walking down a hallway and you see your soft shadow 
goes along with you projecting on the wall on the environment that make everything look real. Follow me, Turkey. Okay. The flashlight brought a whole new spin on it, so some of the environments end up being really, really.